Hi, my name is Ted Pavlik, and I'm here from Arizona State University. And I'd like to chat with you today about a paper that we have coming out in Integrative and Comparative Biology that was the result of an NSF uh, jumpstart meeting on, uh, on so-called reintegrating biology. Now, reintegrating biology is a project that comes out of the Emerging Frontiers program at NSF, where their goal is to look across the various sub-disciplines of, um, of that are supported by NSF and, um, and ask how might we reintegrate across those subdisciplines to get a kind of bigger questions like, you know, buzzwords are going on in a set right now, like, like the, you know, what are the rules of life? And so in order for us to kind of uh, tackle this, my group uh, got together and we said, you know, well, what we first need to agree on are maybe some spatiotemporal scales that we think collectively together span the space of uh, living systems research right now. And so we came up with these six discrete scales. You might argue that each, uh, that we could have um, you know, refined these even further. Maybe we could have made little bigger ones, smaller ones. But we thought this kind of spanned the space of, of life sciences pretty well. Now, each one of these scales is associated with a strong discipline that has done a lot of great things by itself. For example, you know, at the molecular scale, We've got people in working in molecular biology doing great work, um, focusing on kind of this kind of biochemical level of investigation of biology. You can pop that up to the cell level. We've got cell microbial biologists um, focusing on, you know, what is a cell, what's in a cell, how do cells proliferate, et cetera, et cetera. You pop up a little bit farther to the organ scale. That's where we see physiology come into play, um, homeostatic processes, metabolism, respiration, nutrition, et cetera. Um, a little bit farther up, those um, organs turn into organisms at the organismal level. Um, in organismal biology, that's where we start seeing um, evolution becoming um, much more apparent and much more important. Then at the community scale, scale, where those organisms all kind of come together, then we start really seeing spatial and temporal scales becoming very explicit. And, um, and then those communities come together and then we start seeing at the level of the ecosystem, you know, then e even more, you know, how, what is the spatial extent of an ecosystem? How do ecosystems change over time? Then these, these spatial and temporal scales become even more prevalent. And so we thought that this kind of captured um, a lot of the work that, uh, that currently goes on in living systems. And it allowed us to think about the frameworks that, have um, currently been used in an attempt to reintegrate. So for example, in um, evolutionary developmental biology, so developmental biologists trying to incorporate um, you know, evolution into the process of understanding development have kind of formed lenses on which they can look as developmental biologists at the rest of biology. So in a paper, um, you know, the Rydell in 2000, they kind of used a philosophical framework based on Aristotle's causes that sort of talked about how the organism was so important to biology and kind of used developmental biology and the notion of the organism to kind of look across all of the other scales um, using kind of Aristotle's four causes as kind of the, the framework that linked them all together. And this, um, this I think, worked well for the, the group that they were having, you know, discussions with, but um, it kind of ignored the fact that this exact same framework was developed decades earlier by Nico Timbergen at the, the organismal scale when organismal biologists were looking at all of biology from their specific lens. And you know, this framework was great for them, but it hasn't really, um, isn't really talked as, about, as much about in the, the lower scales because you know, the, the vernacular that is used in this kind of organismal scale, this, so this word mechanism, it maybe um, means enough to be useful for to an organismal biologist, but needs much more specific definitions for people working at the lower scales of organ, cell, and molecule. And so um, it ends up not being a useful integrative uh, uh, you know, tool in itself. And so what we were trying to do is to find a common vernacular to get these subdisciplines out of these types of silo mentalities so that they could finally facilitate a shared conversation about living systems. And so what we thought is, well, can we come up with four resources that exist at each one of these six spatiotemporal scales? And the four resources that we came up with that we thought were pretty general were energy, conductance, storage, and information, which we called XC. Now, um, each one of these, um, I can kind of go through and define at each one of these scales. So um, energy, I think everyone 
you know, I, I don't think anyone would, would argue that energy is important to life sciences at all scales, energy from the sun, energy from trophic levels, um, each organism needs to eat something though to, to, to the energy to do what it, uh, what it needs to do. Each one of the organs needs energy, you know, or energy at the cells, um, energy that limits metabolic processes. And so energy clearly everywhere, but it's not enough to just say that there is energy there. The fact that energy is limited seems to be really important. The fact that a lot of things are limited, nutrients, for example, limited, et cetera, made us think that the other resource that needs to be accounted for whenever we talk about biological systems at any scale is conductance as well. So the sun is only irradiating the earth 12 hours of a day. In the winters, you get a different amount of sun than in the summers. And so there is a limitation on the energy that's being delivered to the planet. There's a limitation on how much energy can be delivered from one trophic level to another trophic level. And so there are these rate limitations that go on here. But I don't want to make you think it's all about energy. Like I said, it could also be nutrients or other mass flows, or it could be things that are more abstract. So we talk about gene flow. Well, that is a limitation on conductance. You know, if you get alleles that are trapped behind different barriers, then that has um, major implications for biodiversity and so on, and oh, and speciation. Um, insular biogeography. So island biogeography theory is much about how easy it is to, for an organism to get from one space to another. So conductance is really fundamental. And even at lower time, uh, lower scales, you know, when an animal eats something, those nutrients don't actually get into the incorporated into the bloodstream until some time after that. So there is a rate limitation there. At the lowest scale, it takes time to turn ADP into ATP. And then it gets, takes time for that ATP to be found by metabolic processes inside the, scale, the cell. And so we can talk about limitations in flux, um, you know, at all of these different scales. Now, there are ways to mitigate problems with limitations in flux, and that's why we also need to talk about storage at each one of these scales. A lot of nutrients get stored inside the liver, for example. ATP stores energy so that you don't have to use it right when you get it. So storage is something that is occurring at low scales. It's also occurring at these bigger scales. So of course there's energy storage, storage inside batteries, storage um, inside you know, trophic levels and so on. But we can also talk about storage of alleles in subpopulations. We can talk about storage of biodiversity. If there's a certain biodiversity in, um, in a certain um, you know, insular group and you can connect it to another insular group, then that initial biodiversity is going to change the trajectory um, of those, uh, those two groups over time. And so um, storage, we think, is really important. And then the last thing that we think is important is, um, is information. And so we're using information in kind of the uncertainty reduction sense, the entropic um, sense, where we're talking about um, uh, uh, cues that can help you reduce the uncertainty in a quantity over time. And so if you know when the sun is going to rise and when it's going to set, it can change your behavior. If you know when the seasons are going to come, it can change your behavior. If you know how hungry you are, it can change your behavior. If a metabolic process um, has a certain amount of ATP that's available, then the amount of ATP that's available is a bit of information that can change how those processes flow. So we think that these four um, resources, energy conductance, storage, and information, clearly can be found across all of the spatiotemporal scales that we've discussed. We've discussed them in the case of a consumer, but we also view them as being just as important for an autotroph, for a plant, and we can you could go through this process for all of those. Now, once you have all of these four resources, then what can you do with them? Well, one of the things we thought we could examine uh, existing theories that, um, that, if, that maybe exist within certain subdisciplines, and maybe if we conceptualize them within these four um, boxes, then that helps make them maybe a little bit more portable. So for example, optimal foraging theory, this um, is a theory about animals foraging for energy. So energy is definitely there. That energy is stored within patches. Those patches, each one of them, you can't immediately get all of the energy out of the patch. It takes time and you have to find those patches. And so those patches are spaced apart from each other. And those two things together set a maximum amount of energy that you can extract from 
an environment. So it's a rate limitation. Now, an animal by default is not going to extract energy at that rate. So in theory, they can use the transit time between patches as a cue to change their behavior to try to maximize energetic exploitation of an environment. And so there it is, all four things in this particular theory um, here. Now, that was a, a narrative where I've talked about information about the external environment. We can also talk about um, processes that involve information about the inside of an organism. So we go from optimal foraging theory to risk sensitive foraging theory. Then we start thinking about that animal when it needs to meet certain energetic thresholds by the end of the day for it to survive. So in those cases, if the, uh, if the internal stores of energy inside the animal are low, then it tends to actually, is predicted to spend less time in patches than optimal foraging theory would predict. If the stores inside an animal are higher, then it's predicted to spend more time in patches than optimal foraging theory would predict. And this sensitivity to the internal information about starvation actually can be shown in the theory to minimize the uncertainty of um, about um, future rewards. In other words, to minimize the downside risk that the animal is not going to survive. And so this is an example where we've got the um, inward direction where we're making use of the inner, inner information inside. And so um, that's kind of just sort of an example of how we can reconceptualize existing theories using these. If we look at other theories more generally, like the metabolic theory of ecology, for example, these are theories that maybe have really elegant background, but still a lot of deviations empirically from, from data. And we might say, well, where do those deviations come from? Well, we can ask, do those theories account for all four of these, what we say are necessary resources? And if they don't, then by adding in components that account for the missing ones, maybe we start explaining the deviations from that data. Alternatively, maybe we could come up with totally new general theories that are just based upon these four boxes. And so if we account for these four things, um, then maybe we'll find that there's trade-offs among them. If you get more conductance, you can uh, you can give uh, you know give away. You need less information, and so on and so forth. And just in general, if we all start talking in terms of these four resources, we start being able to integrate across the subdisciplines that go across these different scales using that same vernacular to get these conversations going. So that really great discoveries in one subdiscipline will drift down to others below it and bubble up to others above. All right, so that's. Um, basically a nutshell of this framework that we kind of talk about in this paper. If you want more details and uh, about how each one of these might be applied at a different scale, um, I uh, occur, um, encourage you to take a look at the paper. Um, otherwise, if you have questions or comments about the framework, I'd love to hear them and feel free to reach out. And I've got some contact info in the top left. Thanks for your time.